An adaptation is not a replacement for the original source material. They exist more as supplementary material, something you consume alongside the original story as a means of enhancing the experience. However, adaptations are incapable of being exact translations of their source. Some characters and plot beats are cut, reworked, or condensed in order to allow for a better flow or to fit a certain creative vision. But this is not an excuse to butcher the story in favor of artistic license. It seems that some creators misunderstand this fact and completely alter the original work, changing the themes, essence, and characters to such an extent that it no longer becomes supplementary, but a separate entity entirely. This is not necessarily a bad thing. However, if you are a fan of the original story, you may come to dislike a lot of the changes made. In this video, we'll be taking a look at two unmade superhero films that may have taken a bit too much creative liberties. Nowadays, Spider-Man is a multi-million dollar property that spawns multiple films and spin-offs on a yearly basis, so it's hard to imagine that just a couple of decades prior, the character was found only on the small screen through skits, low-budget TV shows, and cartoons. This was until the early 1980s, an era in which Marvel saw the big screen potential of the character and as a result, began passing around the film rights to multiple directors. Director Roger Corman was one of the many directors attached to the project, but he'd leave due to creative differences with Stan Lee. After seeing what he did with the Fantastic Four, I'd say we dodged a major bullet. It wasn't until Canon Films acquired the film rights that the project would start taking a very strange turn. Director Toby Hooper would become attached as the director of the project. Hooper was mostly known for his work on grotesque horror films such as The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, so it's understandably hard to imagine him helming a Spider-Man film. However, we've seen that horror directors are often flexible and are able to direct films with drastically different styles and tones, especially when you look through Hooper's filmography. Spider-Man may have been a lighter character, but he still had plenty of stories that really pushed him to his emotional and moral breaking point. Hooper may have been an unorthodox pick, but his experience directing darker films may have been exactly what the property needed to break new ground. If only things were this simple. In some strange case of miscommunication, Canon Films didn't actually know who or what Spider-Man was. When they initially bought the rights for the property, they were under the impression that Spider-Man was a popular horror figure similar to the Wolfman, a mythological or science fiction monster that they could turn into a profitable creature film. The film would have centered on a scientist forcibly transforming Peter Parker into a giant, suicidal spider monster. Using his newfound abilities, he would then fight against the scientist and his army of monsters. The movie's premise itself doesn't sound bad. In fact, there's a high possibility that the film would have been a pretty good creature flick akin to films like The Fly or The Blob. Toby Hooper contributed significantly to the world of horror, so there's a possibility that this body horror monster film would have cemented itself as one of the great horror films of the 1980s. However, this statement only applies if this film wasn't supposed to be a Spider-Man adaptation. There's a difference between taking creative liberties with a character and misunderstanding him to such an extent that he becomes a completely different entity entirely. Hooper's Spider-Man would have been a great, maybe even fantastic low-budget film. However, as an adaptation of Spider-Man, the film would have been an insult to the character's legacy and cement itself as one of the worst superhero adaptations of all time.
once again Batman has continued to prove that he's one of DC's most valuable properties. Because of the nature of the character's existence, he can be written to reflect any time period or world, whether it's the past, the present, or various different futures. Countless directors and creative teams have given their unique takes on the character. Darren Aronofsky was one of the few directors who got to pitch their interpretation of Batman, and although the film never saw the light of day, it's still interesting to see his unique approach to a Batman film. Teaming up with writer Frank Miller, Darren crafted a vastly different take on the Cape Crusader, a story in which a street-level Batman lives among the criminals in a grungy 1990s Gotham City. Much like Nolan and Reeves, Aronofsky envisioned his Batman existing in a grounded reality. However, his version truly existed in a world much like our own. Darren Aronofsky's Batman Year One would have centered on a depressed and obsessive Bruce Wayne, who after losing all his fortune, would become an auto mechanic in the slums of Gotham. After seeing just how crime-ridden the city was, Bruce would dive into the world of vigilantism in order to make sense of his life and wage his one-man war on crime. Aronofsky's films often center on obsessive characters, people who are compulsively driven to fulfill their desires, whether it's fame, perfection, addiction, or scientific progress. His characters' pursuit of their goals often lead to their self-destruction, and they must learn to overcome their obsessions to truly achieve their desires. When you think about this, Aronofsky seemed on paper to be the perfect fit to direct a Batman film. His version of the character is truly obsessed with the criminal element and seeks to strike fear into their hearts to the point where he lives amongst them to understand how they operate. Aronofsky took influence from Taxi Driver when it comes to how Bruce Wayne would be portrayed, a disillusioned man who sees the corruption and filth that's overtaken his city and puts matters into his own hands. By stripping Bruce Wayne of his fortune, Aronofsky attempts to depict a much more grounded Batman, one that truly operates at the street level. That's why many of his iconic gear and skills have been stripped down to be more believable. Bruce didn't travel the world to learn various skills. Instead, all his fighting knowledge was learned through a book. All his gadgets are much more practical and based in the real world. His bat suit is assembled using material anyone on the streets could acquire. And since Bruce works at an auto repair shop, the Batmobile is a modified car akin to what we see in the early comics. Even the Batman persona itself was born out of media sensationalism and not something Bruce came up with himself. This isn't really a Batman film but a story of a broken man who decides to wage a one-man war on crime that he has no hope of winning. Many of the character's most iconic elements have been stripped away, leaving him a shadow of what Batman is supposed to be, and by setting it in such a hyper-gritty and realistic world, the fantastical nature of the character's existence no longer applies and truly makes you question Bruce Wayne's mental state. By the end of the story, Bruce would have reclaimed his family fortune and truly evolved into the Caped Crusader. Aronofsky attempted to create a violent and grounded depiction of the character. It's an interesting approach to a year one story that did have potential due to Aronofsky's track record. Aronofsky's filmography proved that he could tackle characters like Batman since he's obsessive like a lot of his characters and Frank Miller's collaboration made sure that the spirit of the Batman wouldn't be lost. Unfortunately, Aronofsky made too much bold decisions to warrant faith from Warner Brothers.